companies and organizations around the world have been hit with a big shock last year and we are still coping with it. As an educator, I know a little bit about what this means for education. So in the institution I work at, we've had to deal with the falling cash flows, having to uh, rejig our teaching to move away from classrooms to teaching online. But Agastya's story is very superficially similar, but on the ground completely different. We're talking about a context where going online means using mobile phones and WhatsApp calls, not Wi-Fi and Zoom. We're talking about a context where people get onto two-wheeler scooters and drive for 50, 60, 100 kilometers to reach fairly remote villages, to reach kids who now have no access to schooling because it's been shut down as the consequence of the pandemic. We're talking about a context where not just the students, but their entire family are probably adversely affected because of this pandemic. And that will have knock-on effect on these children as well. In that context, to not just survive, but to come out stronger with a new portfolio of products, services, ideas, that's remarkable. And it's that particular aspect of what we see in Agastya that I think makes it a really interesting case for us to take a close look at, to see what can we learn about resilience to such unexpected shocks, coupled with extremely harsh constraints, to still come out strong at the other end. Hello, friends, and welcome to a new episode of the Building Resilience series. Today, our mission is to enable you to win the battle of resilience by sparking your creativity and curiosity. My guests are Ram Ragavan, an education innovator and the founder of Agastya International Foundation, and Panish Puranam, professor of strategy and organizational design at INSEAD. Prepare to get amazed by how people with ordinary backgrounds achieved the extraordinary and brought education to life during the harshest moments of the pandemic. 15 million children, remote villages, cow sheds turned into home labs, mobile service vans, passion, initiative, care, and true leadership. This is an educational movement that is transforming an entire country. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share your thoughts in the comment section below. Hello, Ramji. Hello, Panish, and welcome to Building Resilience. Hi, uh, Yulia. Pleasure. Hi, Yulia and Ramji. Nice to be here. I've read so much about Agastya and the deeds that you've done in, in the past years, and I was looking forward to this conversation. Ramji, you do indeed have, uh, have an interesting background, and I'm quite curious about your motivation to start Agastya, and how did you persevere? I'm sure this was not an easy journey to get Agastya where it is right now, and I've seen your creativity lab, I've seen the kind of work that you are doing. What made you choose this path, and what made you stay on this path? Right. So the uh, thinking behind Agastya has a very long gestation, possibly a couple of decades. You know, when I was a kid in a school, in a boarding school in southern India, in a beautiful valley, I read a book about the uh, a, a mythical Himalayan kingdom called Shangri-La. Okay. And I used to dream of li living in Shangri-La. And as I grew older, I thought, you know, we should build a school in a, in a place like Shangri-La that would nurture creative kids who would come out and change the world. I read another book by Herman Hesse, uh, Magister Ludi, I think it was called, about all these smart kids. So some kind of vision came into my brain about Shangri-La, a school for creativity and so on. And uh, like many of us, you know, it could have been a childhood dream or vision wishful thinking, London Business School, and so on. But even at LBS, I found I ran into a guy from India who began to speak to me about uh, Che Guevara. And I'd never heard of Che Guevara, so I read a book about his life, and I was captivated. And I thought, you know, after my degree, I will try and get a job in Cuba. So after my degree in 78, at the height of the Cold War, I walked up to the Cuban embassy in Hyde Park in London. And there was a lady there and she said, what brings you here? And I said, can you give me a work visa? I'd like to work in a sugarcane plantation in Cuba. And she looked at me like I was on drugs. And she said, uh, sorry, not possible. And uh, I didn't persevere, maybe I should have. So I walked out with my tail between my legs, came back to India and told my parents that I want to go and work in a village in uh, Northern India, a very backward area with a Dutch group that was doing some development work. 
and where this uh, friend of mine, Swami from LBS, was working. And so I was very excited. My parents were very concerned. He's gone and got an MBA at LBS, and now he wants to go and work in the villages in North India. And I was about to do that, except this guy, Swami, showed up home one night, chain smoking, looking very worried. I said, what's the matter? He said, I've quit my job and I'm heading to Nigeria. And I said, why did you quit your job? And he said, uh, because uh, you know, I was trying to disintermediate the middlemen in that village. So they got very upset and threatened to uh, literally hang me, you know, hang me. So I decided, uh, you know, I didn't have the courage to continue with this and quit. So that put paid to my plans to get involved in the social uh, sphere. I ended up with Citibank and continued working there for many years. And, uh, you know, you reach this point in time in life, which I did, when you begin to question, uh, what are you doing? Why are you doing? Is this what you really want to do? And I wasn't clear what I really wanted to do, except I remember being held up at gunpoint in Puerto Rico in a restaurant. And the guy threatened to shoot me and an American colleague of mine. And fortunately, he left with all the jewelry and wallets that he'd gathered. And I remember at that time thinking, you know, uh, the only person I could think of at that time was my mother, not Citibank, not the desire to become a CEO and all the presentations to senior management and all that. So I said, hey, at that crunch moment, you were not thinking about your career and career progression and money. You were thinking about your mother. So obviously what you're doing is not it. It's something else. And that helped to clarify my thinking. And I said, you know, I've got this idea of this uh, idyllic school in the Himalayas. Let's go and make it happen. And, uh, you know, to cut a long story short, uh, I took the plunge. So that's how I uh, decided to get involved in education in India. And uh, I think the second part of the question was about persevering through it, correct? So obviously, Yulia, this was a big, big plunge uh, from London, where we were enjoying a great life into the villages of India, kind of extreme jump. Uh, but I felt a sense of freedom and liberation. There was, you know, I didn't report to anyone. You don't have to go to the office, no pressure, none of that. And it was all clean slate. So I said, look, I have this rough idea and I'm convinced it'll be a great idea. Let's see how we can make it happen. And I managed to gather a rather interesting group of people around me. Besides my father, there was the former chairman of India's Atomic Energy Commission. And he said, this is really interesting, your focus on creativity. Do you really understand what creativity is? And I said, uh, maybe not, I can't articulate it. So we did a brainstorming and we came up with the components of creative thinking and behavior, if you like. And that was fascinating. You know, it was about curiosity, discovery, experimentation, association, application and all that. And that became the mission of the foundation. Now, I remember asking the scientist, are you born creative or can you learn to be creative? And he said, look, you know, you, you're a non-science guy. I will give you a hundred counterintuitive science experiments. And I guarantee you in a couple of months, you'll begin to view the world around you very differently. So you can learn to be more observant and curious and all the rest of it. Now, I can't guarantee that you can become an Einstein or a Ramanujan, but on a scale of creativity, if you're at 0.5, I'm sure we could take you up to three or four. And if we did that at scale, then we'd bring about transformation in the country. So, you know, my vision expanded. And I say that because that gave me more fuel and motivation that, ah, this is something that's potentially very big and transformative. And maybe it can impact the entire country. So that a large vision, and honestly, I was in love with the idea of Augustia. It was a romance. So, you know, I'm sure you've fallen in love. You tend to ignore many, many things and hurdles. First five years of Augustia, there was very little progress. And I look back and wonder 
Why didn't I, you know, pack up my bags? But I didn't. I suppose the other reason was desperation. I'd burnt my boats. There's no question of going back to London and the financial industry. And so, you know, you had to make it happen. And finally, I began to realize that the journey was a lot of fun. I was meeting a lot of people from different walks of life. So I was never bored. My mind was very stimulated. I used to read a lot of books, meet people, ask them questions. And, and so that kept me going as well. And I, I think these are some of the factors that, that sort of added up uh, to make me continue persevere with the journey. So the mission is about creativity. What's the purpose of Agastya? Hmm. The purpose. Well, I haven't thought through that one, but let me try and answer it uh, indirectly. The vision I have, not so much for Agastya, but for India, is a nation of curious and creative souls. Okay. And if you read a little bit of Indian history, there was the famous uh, golden age of North, North India. And uh, they say there were three reasons for the golden age. And one was economics. They had these guilds, so there was prosperity and there was money to spend on things. The second was very enlightened rulers that patronized the arts and learning. And the third was curiosity. So my sense was, if we can trigger something at scale, right, then that could lead to a nation of curious, creative, inventive, innovative people. And uh, that it was possible to do that without too much money if you came up with ideas that could be scaled and leveraged. So I still believe that. Uh, we haven't reached it by any stretch, but I still believe that. So I suppose that was the purpose. That's, if you like, the end purpose. But as I said earlier, Yulia, I've learned, one of the things I've learned from Augustia is that whether you achieve your goal or not, because goals can change, uh, things are beyond your control, what you might be able to control is how much you enjoy the process of trying to get there. So that's equally important, uh, enjoying the journey of it so that you don't have any regrets, you know? Uh, while I'm on my deathbed or God forbid, at gunpoint again, I can certainly look back and say, hey, that was a lot of fun. Along the way and along the journey, you've managed to attract people to join you and to share in this passion. And one of them is uh, Panish. So Panish, a direct question to you. What is your relationship with Agastya? Um, I think friend is probably the most accurate description. Uh, I've been a researcher there. So along with colleagues at uh, NCIAD and at Stanford, we've done a research project uh, looking at the implications of design thinking as an alternative path to creativity for the children at Agastya. Uh, my wife is also a researcher who's actually studied Agastya. In particular, their challenges for scaling up. Uh, my parents have endowed a scholarship there in the name of their parents. So our family is kind of connected. My son did an internship there as well. So we are kind of family friends of Agastya, if you like. Uh, but, you know, what I find also interesting about them is it's a place where uh, fairly sophisticated thinking about organization and management meets a purpose which is non-commercial in nature. So I don't have windows into many such sites to see this combination. For me, this is the Petri dish that Agastya offers to look at and study and understand. What I find quite interesting about Agastya is that because of Ramji's unusual background as somebody who has a training in the world of business, he has an MBA from London Business School and a successful career there, he approaches the problem of doing good in the world with a kind of mindset that you don't often see in the non-for-profit sector. And as a consequence, I think the way he approaches his organization and the way the organization is run, I think can deliver some very interesting insights and lessons, not just for the not-for-profit sector, but back to the corporate sector again, particularly in terms of how to motivate the organization in terms of mission and purpose. Ramji, you work with underprivileged children, which someone would call at some point, especially in, in uh, the midst of a pandemic, that they are chronically vulnerable. 
Can you tell us a bit how does this pandemic affect them? How easy or hard was it was to keep them in school, keep them creative, keep them focused on what's important for them? Sure. Well, it's it's been awful, you know, terrible for all of us, and even more so for underprivileged children and and their families. I'll give you an example. I often get on the phone. I ask my people to arrange. Uh, conversations with some of the children, and uh, I was talking to this girl who lives in a place called Kanchipuram in Chennai, about six seven hours by road from Bangalore, where I live. And I was asking her. This was during the sort of fever pitch of the crisis. And I said, "So how are you studying and adapting to all of this?" And she said, "You know, sir, my father lost his job." He was an auto rickshaw driver. He lost his job and his income, and uh, so uh, we stopped eating rice. And I didn't know what to say. And I said, "Well, how do you manage then?" Well, there is. We managed to get some substitute, but we've cut out vegetables. And she felt so strongly for her father, so deeply. She said, "You know, I really feel sorry for him." Because he has nothing now, okay. And I didn't want to get into so how are you dealing with school and so on because this was way beyond that. Another girl in North Karnataka said, "I was hoping to get a scholarship to get get into this college, and uh, that was taken away. My whole future was now up for grabs." I said, "What did you do?" Fortunately, some friends came together. And loaned her some money to pay the university fees. So people were going through and are going through some very, very trying, difficult experiences. Now, within all of that, we had a chat with a lot of kids who used to ask me, "How do I deal with this? How do I live my life?" And I would tell them, "Look, you know, this might sound easier than." you know actually doing in life but can we look at this even remotely as a possibility and opportunity and we began to brainstorm what is it what are the positives we can take from this for instance do you get to spend more time with your mother or your father what kind of chats or discussions do you have with them do you ask them questions are you looking inward you know most of us rarely look inward So look at your own emotions how you're reacting to this situation and ask yourself you know are you growing as an individual because of that introspection so these are some of the sorts of discussions we've had but at a more educational level what we did is you know Fanish said for for example that he sees himself as a friend of Agastya now that's a very profound thing and I'll tell you why a few years ago I went to a uh government school and i i was talking to a bunch of young girls and i asked them why do you come to agastya and they said well you know you have all these very interesting hands on learning models which we don't have in our school so that's why we come to agastya so i said okay i will give you a set of hands on models i'll gift that to your school will you still come to agastya and they thought for a bit and said yes So I said, "Well, why would you come now? You have the models." Well, because your teachers know how to bring these models alive. Our teachers are not trained to do that. I said, "Ah, brilliant point. You know what? I'll do you a favor. I'll train your teachers for free. They will know how to bring the models alive in the classroom." Okay, happy? And they said, "Yes." I said, "Okay, bye." So I'm not going to see you again at Agastya, I guess. And they huddled again, and maybe they wanted me to feel good. And they said, "No, we'll still come to Agastya." But why would you come to Agastya? You have the models, teachers are trained. They said because the Agastya teacher is our friend. So ultimately, it's the human emotion and the connection that comes out of it. That's the key. So in this covid period that has been accentuated even more. So when we started doing things with kids we came up with new uh 
what we call explore, play, learn modules delivered online. So we could do this online training. We uh, help the kids figure out how to transform their home into a laboratory, what sorts of experiments they could do using simple everyday available materials. So they began to get engaged, right? And actually transform their home into a learning environment, which was a learning, an opportunity. And it was an opportunity that we discovered as well. So this sort of blended learning has made a huge difference to the kids we've been working with. But at the root of it is while you do this, those kids need a shoulder to lean on. They need to feel someone cares for them. Someone is bothered about their learning and their development. So the teachers intersperse their teaching with stories, jokes, you know, things like that to humanize the whole relationship. So that's, that's the key. Otherwise, there is a risk, and I'm not saying it hasn't happened. I'm sure tens of millions of kids have lost their self-belief and confidence because of what's happened, not just kids, but adults as well. So uh, that's, these are some of the things that we've been doing, and we've also been working with the school teachers because equally they need those sorts of inputs. They need the ability to connect to learn so that they can then pass it on to the kids because all the schools were closed. They've just started to reopen them. But till a couple of weeks ago, most of the schools in India were closed for the lockdown. Finally, we had these mobile science vans so we could take them into the villages. And so even if they couldn't come to the school, we could take our vans and all the learning to the villages. So that was another plus. I've, I've seen the converted cow sheds. I've seen people yeah. and your teachers doing, uh, running videos uh, and uh, conference videos by, on their phone and really having this intricate uh, kind of uh, support for their phones and for their experiments. And I've seen your vents as well. What struck me is, and, and what, what strikes me is the scale at which you've managed to do this in a very short time. Did you manage to reach the same number of people with this blended kind of learning? Are you still growing there? And what can we learn from what you've done, especially growing as, as scale, education at scale, online and, and offline? Right, so uh, let me answer the last part of your question first, and then come to some of the other uh, questions. So in terms of scale, what we did early on, as I said, my vision was a school for creative kids or a school that would nurture creativity. That morphed into something very different, which was trying to answer the question, can you raise the speed limit of creativity of an entire country? So instead of filling a glass with water, we decided we would try and raise the level of the ocean by a millimeter, right? So scale thinking came into our minds very early. And I was fortunate, you know, there are many disadvantages for working for big organizations, and I won't go into them. But having worked at an organization like Citibank, if nothing else, you tended to think big in scale and the world. So I came with that kind of thinking. The former chairman of the Energy Commission was a big thinker. He was thinking about what we need to do to transform India. My father had run a lot of large organizations. So the thinking early on was how can we transform the country? And that's very important because that thinking began to seep down as the organization began to grow to the lowest levels. So that helped us philosophically, if you like, in terms of a culture of scaling. And that's very important. Right. The second thing, of course, is how do you manage it? Because you might have a culture of scaling, but it's you've got to execute and manage it effectively. And uh, since we are so dispersed across India in very remote areas with poor infrastructure and so on, we were forced to take a very decentralized approach to how we manage, which means you have somebody out in a remote outpost. And you, you can't see that person, uh, perhaps you can virtually now, but those days it was a lot more difficult. Maybe it's on the phone. 
So you've got to trust that they will do the right thing. So we began to create a very decentralized management structure, and that has helped us to scale. So these are some of the factors. Of course, the culture of innovation, I think, is very important because you have to ask yourself, what is it that you're scaling? You know, you don't, you don't want to scale rubbish. You want to scale something that has impact. And every time you scale, you're worried about losing richness and quality. So how do you manage that in an optimum way? So these have been some of the challenges. But uh, essentially, uh, scale has become been woven into the fabric of Augustia's thinking and actions. And that has helped us do it. What, and maybe this is a question for both of you, what can co corporations learn from this? So, you know, I think one way is you've got to develop a capacity for unconventional thinking, make unusual connections. Otherwise, you're going to try and scale something you're familiar with and then very quickly figure out that it's not scalable or it's not affordable, even if you could scale it. it it's just going to cost an arm and a leg. So one of the things we did, for instance, if you look at creativity, uh, the general thinking is creativity is for the rich or well-off, or maybe in a few alternative schools. In Augustia, we upended that thinking by saying creativity for the poor, right? So you're taking something that appears to be demanding in terms of resources and saying, I'll make it available to the mass and to the poor. So how is that possible? Well, you have to think very differently and say, you know, take this for instance, great. Can you see it? Yep. Uh, it's called a tippy top. And if you put it on a surface, it sits on its bottom. When you spin it, remarkably, it tips over and begins to spin on its stem, right? Very unexpected and you go, ah, how did that happen, right? Now, this is so powerful. There's actually a picture on the internet of uh, Niels Bohr and Wolfgang Pauli in 1951, looking at the tippy top and smiling. And I guess they're trying to figure out how it happens and why it happens. So there's enormous learning in this. There's just one little thing, which costs all of 10 cents in India, right? So here is something literally you can carry around the country and spend hours trying to figure out what's the ah, aha, and ha ha in this. And I carry it around with me and I've figured out the ah, because you don't have to be terribly smart for that. Ha ha, because I find, find it very enjoyable. But I haven't worked out the aha, because there's a lot of physics and math in it. So there are many, many extremely powerful ways of inciting creative thinking and provoking it that costs awfully little. So you can do powerful things, you can scale this, it doesn't cost anything uh, and have enormous impact. So if you want to scale education, you have to look at education very differently, right? Again, Obviously, digital and so on is going to help you scale, but that's almost conventional thinking because anybody can do it. And it may or may not have the kind of impact you want to have if you're thinking of creativity and so on. So in Augustia, for instance, I think we were blessed. Uh, we didn't plan it that way. I didn't plan it that way. The founders of Augustia, except for one who was not terribly active, were all non-educators a corporate CEO, nuclear physicist, an ex-banker, an ex-stockbroker, right? So we came at it very differently. And I think that's required. Over to Fanish. So I, I'll say less about scaling education per se, but I think I want to pick up on a couple of ideas Ramji put out there on how is it that Agastya basically was able to recover from the, the shock of the pandemic relatively fast and even find new ways of meeting their purpose and what can we learn from that more generally. So broadly what we know in organization science is organizations are resilient when they do two things. First, they have to be able to buffer, right? When the shock hits, they need to have some resources that kind of prevent the immediate collapse of the system. And in the case of Agastya, it's quite clear that their history of working in remote locations, 
using essentially remote coordination technologies. They may not call it in this technical way, but that's what it is, right? They're working with their staff and teams who are distributed, who they don't see face-to-face -face very often. This already gave them a level of preparation to deal with this need to work in this remote way, which many companies don't have, right? Or did not have. So they came pre-prepared into this battle. That was the buffering. Then there's the story of adaptation. Now that the world has changed, how quickly can you reconfigure things to play the new game? And that's the story of individual initiative as well as system level leadership, encouragement, support systems. So Ramji addressed both of these. The question I have for him actually, if I may, is the following. In many corporate contexts, the thing that holds back the adaptation is fear. The first thing many employees ask themselves is, will I still have a job at the end of this crisis? Did that question come up in Agastya and how did you deal with it? Uh, it did, I'm sure it did. Uh, because it's not that anyone called me and said, uh, ask me if they're going to have a job, but I'm sure they did ask their supervisors and they must have discussed it with, with their spouses and so on. So fear was uh, widely prevalent. And by the way, uh, I'm not claiming I was immune to it because I was asking questions like, is the funding for Augusta going to dry up? Because you were reading all these reports about NGO funding is going to crash by 50, 60, you know, maybe 70, 80 percent. And I was thinking, how are we going to manage if it's 40 percent versus 50 or 80? What do we need to do? So fear is a natural, natural response. But you said something, you know, and this is validated by stuff I've discussions I've had with my managers, many of whom tell me that Augustia was primed for a crisis right? That uh, while we might not have uh, proactively managed that way and said, we need to build Augustia for resilience in a crisis, the kinds of things we did, the practices, the remote coordination that you talked about, the culture of continuous innovation, a very strong bias for action. So when this crisis hit, there was fear. Not only was there fear, we had to cut down salaries across the board. So there was a sense that, you know, I have to take a real hit. Uh, but we did have, have this decision to take, which is, should we let go of a few people uh, or should we share the burden and keep those people, even if they didn't have jobs to do? And we said, let's keep the people and let's share the burden and let's sell the idea to the rest of the organization. So we took a hit in salaries, environment got very scary. And then I was asked by somebody that you really have to address the organization because people are really concerned. So I gave a talk and I said, look, the objective reality is we don't know what's going to happen. And it looks like it's going to be pretty brutal. Let's face it, that's the truth. Now, having said that, is there any glimmer of an opportunity in this crisis? Because we all hear and we know, Augustia has a track record of this, of turning every problem into an opportunity. So the opportunity here might be, we've been talking about transitioning Augustia from an organization into a movement. How will COVID accelerate that transition into a movement? So we said, well, digital learning, online, all that suddenly become, you know, center stage. Can we combine that with physical, which we are very strong at? That led to the idea of the home as a laboratory, right? So one of our employees in Gujarat apparently sent out some origami activities on WhatsApp. And to his surprise, a lot of kids responded positively. And that was the trigger that led to our online digital learn. And then we began to get examples of people like the gentleman uh, Pandurang that Yulia talked about, who converted a cow shed into a, you know, online broadcasting station. And all of a sudden, the culture began to uh, manifest itself. Hey, he did this, I should do something and show the organization. Let's celebrate the success. Now we have a new vision. We're going to become a world leader in blended learning. And so while things are not very clear, we don't know how things will evolve. 
this has actually been in that sense a great trigger for something new, brave, and, and interesting for all of us. And uh, then the months went by, we had to take another hit on salary. And again, what we did is senior management took the brunt of it. So we made it obvious to the troops that while we're asking you to reduce your uh, salary by 10 or 15%, senior management is going to take a 50% hit, right? Now, a couple of things we had done earlier, which I didn't realize would be so uh, positive in a COVID context, uh, turned out to be that way. What were they? One was just before the lockdown was uh, announced by India, a month before the lockdown, Agastya closed down. And I remember this discussion with some of my managers and said, should we close down? And people felt, well, there's no real risk right now. I think we're exaggerating and so on. And I said, look, the question is, I have a daughter who's 25 years old. If she were going out to a village to teach 100 children, would I feel comfortable? My wife certainly would object to it. And I said, I would probably tell her, no, not going to take the risk. Now, if that's the way I'm going to behave with my daughter, I don't think it should be any different for the organization. So I said, whether it's rational, logical or not, I wouldn't do this with my near and loved ones. So we shouldn't be doing it with Augustia employees. Later on, as recently as a few weeks ago, managers tell me that that one decision that you took made us feel that the organization really cares for us. So when you asked us to take a hit on compensation, while it was painful, we took it. There was another thing, again, I did inadvertently about 18 months ago. You know, when I was at Citibank, I had a colleague in New York who told me a story in the 80s. We had a very charismatic chairman called Walter Riston. And one day this guy, Joe Rossi, was sitting in his office and he gets a call from Walter Riston. And Joe says, holy cow, why would Walter Riston want to speak to me? And Riston says, Joe, I hear you're the expert in this sort of abstruse area. Would you come and see me in my office and teach me a little bit about it? Because I have to go in for a Senate hearing or something, and I need to speak on this. And when Joe was telling me this, he had tears in his eyes because he couldn't believe that. And it suddenly struck me, it should have struck me decades ago, but it struck me a year and a half ago. I said, let's start calling all our employees at random. So I would call a van driver, a cleaning maid, an instructor and say, hey, I'm Ramji, what's your name? How's work? Do you understand Agastya's mission? And I'm told today that a lot of people still think back to that and say, hey, there's a real connection with this organization. So I think that spirit of caring is very important uh, that has probably held us in good stead in this crisis. I just wanted to add a, a follow-on question to that. So, you know, just to summarize the, the investment in the relationships and the trust in the organization and in the belief of the leadership sincerity took place with without knowing that it will be called upon very soon in the crisis to pay for itself in some sense, but it has paid off, right? That's, that's what you're saying. The other aspect to this is that to adapt to the new normal, there must have been lots of experimentation on the ground. This is what every company has to do, whether it's a bank or a business school like us or a technology company like Google. Post a crisis, the next big challenge after the initial buffering and, and uh, recovery is what do we do now? And nobody knows. So people have to try stuff. Many of the things they try will fail. So there has to be a culture of tolerance for failure and also a culture of amplifying the few successes that come about by random chance and scaling them throughout the organization. It sounds to me again that Agastya is very well positioned to do these two things. Because even in novel times, you have this strong emphasis on local experimentation, isolating best practice and then spreading it throughout the organization. So can you, can you address that a bit? Like how did that help in this context? I think uh, you've hit the nail on the head, Fanish. In fact, uh, one of our top managers who we've designated as the guy who's going to drive Agastya 2.0, mm -hmm. I asked him, how did we survive and come out of this crisis? And let's hope we've come out of it and that it doesn't get any worse. 
And he said, it's the systems and processes. So I said, uh, what system and what process? It's not clear to me. And he said, look, you know, we are very good at originating an idea and bringing it to market rapidly. And that's because we have this content team and we have this other team and they talk to each other and we, we're able to rapid, rapidly prototype ideas and experiment. That has been very, very important to our success in the last 10 months. So I was thrilled to hear that. Uh, the, the other point was, of course, there are other factors. So is that a lot of this was done by people in the front line. So the guy who started the origami thing, you know, no one told him to. He took uh, the initiative to try it out and all of a sudden a single spark led to a prairie fire. Or this guy Pandurang who converted a cow shed. And when I saw that picture, I called people and said, hey, aside from the human angle, this seems very interesting. Can we do more of this? What it did was apparently a lot of other instructors, you see to get online, you have to get the telephone numbers of these kids. And we didn't have them. And the schools were closed and they weren't about to go and you know, open the cupboard and give you all the telephone numbers. So we had to find a way of getting them. And uh, I'm told that our instructors in their own vehicles, because all our mobile vans and everything had come to a standstill, went out driving two, 300 kilometers to villages, literally getting the telephone numbers of kids, okay, and their parents and so on and so forth. So a lot of enabling innovative actions happened uh, in the organization almost as a reflex. And I was so thrilled to hear this, you know, and I said, look, this appears to be an organization while it is being led by people at the top in, in a conventional sense, some of the breakthroughs and uh, inspiring initiatives seem to be done by people in the front lines. And, and so it is a sort of bottom-up visioning that's happening, which is really music to the ears. Which also transforms this from a simple organization into a movement. Uh, exactly. Ranj I'm also curious, your success and Agastya's resilience definitely enables the resilience of the children that you're working with. And I even think that this might even influence the resilience of their families. And further on, this, this will spread. Did you get any feedback, any kind of responses for the families and the children on how powerful this support and this caring proved to be for them and not only for Agastya and their employees? Yeah, you know, we've had uh, one of the things COVID has done for us. Uh, we focused on children and school teachers and not so much on parents. And parents actually are a very important part of this. It's actually a troika, right? Because they play a very important role or can play a very important role in, in nudging their children in the right direction. But COVID forced us to start having conversations with parents. And uh, borrowing from Fanish and Hagi Rao's project on design thinking, we actually started conducting design thinking workshops for mothers who had no clue what design thinking even meant, right? So these were workshops where we would have conversations with them on how's your child managing? What problems do you have? How do you think you might be able to solve them? Let's try and figure out what the problem is. Let's find a way to brainstorm through this. Maybe come up with some possible solutions. That whole process, we began to take parents through this. So that is one aspect of it. The second is, uh, I've personally spoken to a bunch of parents and uh, they're all surprised. You know, the R element in whatever Agastya does, and I hope even the aha and ha ha is very strong. So they had no idea that the home could be a laboratory. So all of a sudden, the kid is talking about kitchen chemistry or doing something with a pair of scissors and, and a pieces of paper and showing his father or mother something and engaging the child. So the parent began to get really interested. They actually began to understand 
what Agastya's mission is all about and what difference it makes or it can make to their own children and actually to themselves. So, uh, yeah, I mean, these are all uh, uh, discoveries that we are making as we go along by, by engaging wholeheartedly in the crisis, trying to figure out possible ways out and solutions. And from all of this, I think will emerge new ways of doing things. Now, I don't want to minimize the fact that 50% of the children we work with do not have access to any form of online learning. So that's a problem. And uh, you know, some of them might have to go out and work and help their parents. Uh, others might be languishing at home. There are many psychological issues. Uh, all of these are real problems. And, and uh, I'm sure post-crisis, a lot of people are going to go and write papers on what's happened and what the consequences might be. But these are serious issues. For sure. But education, and as you've started this movement, will really help to get them strengthened, to have more self-esteem, to have to understand who they are, what they can do, and really trust that they can make a change as well and they can be involved. And that, that really starts with, uh, with education. What's next for Agastya? I know we spoke, uh, and you already mentioned Agastya 2.0. What's this about? And uh, you also mentioned in one of the interviews that I've heard about the Innovation Express. Right. So if I may, you know, so the other significant part of the movement, which I hadn't thought about, which uh, thanks to you and Fanish, because the topic was building resilience, among other things, is it's, I suddenly realized that this movement might be a way of building not just Augusta's resilience, but systemic resilience, right? So if more and more people actually start to learn to do things, uh, start to experiment, to discover, to be curious in a hands-on way across the country, then if the education system comes to a halt, God forbid, again, for any reason, no problem. They can continue doing the things they were doing, right? And they're less dependent on a, on a service provider like Augustia. It fosters independence, and that's going to raise the resilience of the entire system. Now, so in terms of going forward, uh, Augustia 2.0, uh, our plan in terms of numbers is, see, we've reached 15 million children face-to-face, -face, and I suppose in the last eight, months uh, digitally over the last 20 years in very powerful ways. That's pretty impressive uh, by NGO standards. But in India, you have about 300 million kids, right? So in terms of our vision of uh, triggering a movement or you know, making, uh, creating a curious country, we've just been a drop in the bucket. So what we have said is, let's give some numbers to this idea of a movement and say, that in the next five years, we should aim to reach 100 million children. So 15 million children in 20 years, well, we're going to accelerate like crazy and go for 100 million in five years. How are we going to do it? Haven't a clue. In the sense, yeah, there's digital, there's virtual, you know, there are all these sorts of other things. We want to trigger a maker movement. There's a young guy from Stanford, Who's, who's going to work with us on that. He's got some great ideas, uh, all of that. But that's the aim, which means we've got to find ways of mixing physical with digital and virtual. That's a very important thing. The second thing we're going to do is take up what actually Fanish recommended years ago when he visited our campus. He said, I've never seen a campus like this because you've got hundreds of these hands-on learning uh, materials and models and thousands of children coming. And in that interaction is a wealth of information and insight and knowledge for education, which you really haven't tapped into in any systematic way. So you're sitting on a gold mine of research and development. And can you harness that? So the one of the things we're planning to do is to set up a world-class child research and teacher innovation center uh, at Augustia. And we are actually looking around for people like that 
with that sort of ilk and orientation because we need to understand why we've been successful better, what's actually happening in a child's thought process, how the child responds to different forms of learning, physical versus digital versus virtual, to different colors, to different types of toys, all of that requires research. So that is a very important part of Agastya 2.0. The other part is, you know, as someone in the tech industry said, the smartest people in the world don't work for you. And that applies equally to Agastya. So what I'm trying to get Agastya to do is to say now, you know, uh, instead of creating everything within Agastya, however innovative we might be, in terms of sheer scale, we are talking about a different order of magnitude. So the whole world ought to be helping us. So we need to co-create with children. We need to co-create with the teachers whom we treat, uh, train. We need to co-create with a lot more resource persons around the world. Many of them are looking for interesting projects and they're not going to charge an arm and a leg uh, to do that. So we've got to treat the world as our, if you like, development space and do that more effectively if we're going to reach uh, the sort of lofty goals we have for Augustia 2.0. So a lot, of our, a lot of our funders have been corporations through their corporate CSR. And that's very positive. And we, you know, people like Honeywell and Synopsys and a lot of Indian companies and a few H&Is. So uh, yeah, grateful for their support. But by and large, if you ask me, a lot of corporations Maybe, maybe it's the nature of the beast. You know, the other day, uh, one, a, a very large MNC in India asked me to address their employees on meaning and purpose. And from the questions that came to me from these employees, it was clear that most employees lacked a sense of meaning and purpose. Firstly, they didn't know what meaning and purpose meant, whether they had one, and whether their organization had one and how you would even go about aligning that, right? So the problem with a lot of corporations, especially those not involved in the creative industries. You know, when I joined, when I started Augustia and uh, the nuclear physicist PK Iyengar used to joke, he would say, I took a banker and taught him creativity. And he was right because I really hadn't been exposed to what it really meant to be creative and curious and how they are connected and all that. So a lot of corporations don't have that understanding and insight, okay? So they tend to live in a somewhat insular world and, and uh, they lack that. So when you go with a mission and vision of creativity and curiosity, uh, people need time to understand what is it? What does it mean and why is it important, right? So that's one of the challenges we have. But having said that, I would urge a lot of corporations to actually they can transform themselves. The same company came to me, the CEO and said, I'll teach you systems and processes because we're masters at that. You teach me how to create a curious organization because I need to transform this organization. I need it to become more innovative. So I think there's a lot of learning that corporations can get out of an organization like Augustia. So it's not just about writing a check to help a poor children, which is very noble and humane, but it's about what's in it for me. It might be an opportunity for me to learn about what it takes to create a culture of innovation a truly curious and creative organization. And that learning could be worth a lot more to me than writing a few checks. So there's a lot in it for corporations. And uh, so we are talking to a lot of them. We are talking to a lot of academic institutions in India and abroad. We're talking to creativity organizations and saying, would you like to be a part of what we're doing? And by the way, to answer your question on Innovation Express, the whole idea is to create a movement for innovation and uh, it's not restricted to children. It's anyone who's an innovator 
who wants to talk about their innovation, make connections and so on. It's in the early stages, but it's an important part of our, uh, I guess, their 2.0 initiative. So I think there's a lot coming from the corporate sector. You know, I often think I can't undo what's happened in the past. But if I had been exposed to an Augustia type experience in a very uh, concentrated way, like we would send people out to LBS or Harvard for classes, they should have sent people like me and others out to a concentrated Augustia type experience. I think that would have transformed me much earlier into a lot more creative and innovative individual. Uh, even within the within the corporate context, so corporations need to reach out, just as NGOs need to learn from corporations. Would you have some final thoughts to share? Maybe some final learnings from both of you, both from an academic perspective, but also from a hands-on perspective. So I know what I will be teaching in my classes based on my understanding of how Augustia has come through this year. So of course, the capacity to buffer yourself to unanticipated shocks is important. To some extent, that's a matter of luck. Agastya was lucky. They had dealt with the hardship of working remotely in hard to connect areas and that played them out in good stead. But just as important is the culture of constant experimentation, of problem solving, of creativity to use Ramji's term, because that's what you need to adapt to the new normal. That's what every company around us is struggling to do right now to cope with the post pandemic world. For these guys, that's a little bit easier because that's what they've been doing all their life. So that lesson, I think, is an extremely important one, that this is the best preparation you can make. We don't know the shape of the next shock. It may not be a pandemic. It may be something completely different. What we do know is if you build a culture where your employees feel safe, respected, care about the sincerity of the management towards them and vice versa, willing to make experiments, knowing that the cost of failure is small, and willing to then leverage those successful experiments, that's the best preparation you can have. So that's a lesson I think one can draw far beyond the boundaries of just the nonprofit world. You know, I would echo what uh, Fanish is saying in, in terms of a hands-on thing. I worked for a lot of organizations before uh, starting Agestia. It was, it was never clear to me what the mission was, right? Uh, we knew we had to make money and that was fine. Nothing wrong with that. But in Augustia's case, I think the mission became something very special and distinctive. And there are not too many organizations around the world, educational or otherwise, who talk about sparking curiosity, right? And nurturing creativity in a very proactive way. So this ah, ah, ha, 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 which became a very easy to understand way of articulating the mission, gradually became internalized in Augustia's people because it, it was easier to understand and it was easier to relate to because it wasn't something divorced from your day-to-day -day life because it's a way of living. Uh, you spark it, curiosity in others, and you ask yourself, am I curious, right? So when you internalize a mission like that, it takes deep root. And when it takes deep root, that automatically gives you meaning and purpose. So when you're subject to a crisis or uh, any sort of threat, uh, these qualities come to the front. So I think if you have a clear mission that people can relate to in their mind and their heart, very important, the emotional connect, that automatically allows you to win half the battle of resilience. So that's one thing I've learned. The second thing I learned is uh, go where no one's gone before, which is practicing the mission. That there's no point in doing something that someone else has done. If for no other reason than that, it doesn't give you or it doesn't give me any joy or fun. So do things that others will not be prepared to do. Okay, in fact, What I found is if a lot of people advise you to do something and you're confused, just do the opposite of what they're telling you to do. Chances are you've hit upon something where you might fail. It, it could lead to a problem. But I found generally that to be very interesting. The third thing I, for me was a realization was that 
actually to do extraordinary things, you don't need people with extraordinary backgrounds in the sense they don't need to have studied at LBS or INSEAD or Stanford or Harvard or wherever. Because all of these people in Augustia who made things happen, who've internalized the mission, all come from second and third tier rural or semi-urban institutes in India, which leave a lot to be desired. But they all come with the desperate urge to try and correct the, the problems that they have experienced in their lives. So they come with this inbuilt potential to show some passion and to make a difference. And that sort of motivation, again, you've won half the battle with that. So how people from ordinary backgrounds can actually do extraordinary things is another sort of learning in a very hands-on way that, uh, that uh, I have experienced. Ramjay Panish, thank you for a very, very inspiring conversation. Thank you, Yulia. Thank you, Yulia.